Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Just Interesting podcast, the weekly show where we discuss things that we find just interesting. And today, fellas, I, we're going to be discussing something that I know you both find just interesting because we're talking about spies. And uh, oh yes, I, I this is many spies of many eyes. And honestly, <laughs> with the amount that James Bond comes up on this podcast, is this is a kind of a bit of a oh, you know yeah. a, a bit of a trigger for me. Ooh. Little little joke there. Yeah, no. uh, 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 yeah. um, Looking down the gun barrel, squeeze the trigger. But some of the people that we're going to be talking about today, real people who existed in history, make James Did Bond they? look like a Boy Scout. Probably, I don't know. I, I don't know who you're going to I mean, be talking. In some about. cases, possibly, yeah. Um, but that's what we're going to be discussing today. But fellas, how are you doing? How are you? How are you both, uh, Martin? How are you this week? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm good. It's been a it's been a rainy old one in England. Just to keep people updated on the weather. Good. <laughs> so, the kind of getting outside and out and about and fresh air has been at a, at a minimum, really. Um, but the weekend was good and. Um, and at least Saturday was a nice sunny day. <laughs> but Sunday was miserable. Oh, so no so, visits uh, I hope, to... I hope everyone at home oh. in the UK made the most of their Saturday because otherwise you've had a wet and windy week. Did you I feel thanks, like thanks, one Alex, day I might go? I want to go back through the podcast every single episode. We're on 149, by the way, I believe. So <laughs> let's go back through all the 149 uh, episodes. Goodness. Every time we talk about the weather, I want to make a compilation. Oh. And see how yeah. long it gets. Maybe it'll be a bonus episode. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the worst special 150 episode that we could possibly do. <laughs> Just a compilation of like weather updates over the last four years. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be great, would it? Robin, how, how have you been? How's your week been? Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Today I participated, or I, I did a made, took a major step in participating in a, a nationwide international perhaps even <laughs> survey called our future health which is a, a research project that's aiming to get five million people to volunteer uh, and in my case uh, i gave blood and as well as medical information and it's looking at the long-term health of people over time and by looking at so many people it's going to um, hopefully be able to uh, support research that will s solve all kinds of health problems so in my case, um, it's taken two blood samples and one sample will be analysed for genetic data and the other sample will be preserved for future studies. Wow. Interesting. Well, I can't talk about what I've been up to up. now, can I? Because that's like, how am I supposed to top that? Oh, no, <laughs> not supposed to, it's not a competition, Ali. It's not a competition. I'll Martin's what, watched a there, there documentary... And Robbins yeah. saved the world. So. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. I'm just Help participating in everything. Uh, oh, so if you're interested, you can get a £10 voucher for participating as well. That's a that's a really good thing, though, Robin. Well done for doing that. That's, uh, mm. Maybe we'll put... I recommend anyone who's interested uh, to just look it up. It's called Our Future Health. Yeah. We'll, we'll put Being some information the in the description, maybe. Uh, so would you like a riddle before we really get into the meat of the podcast? Oh, give it to me, Alex. Yeah, go on then. Here's the riddle for this week. Two men are in a desert. They both have backpacks on. One of the guys is dead. The guy who's alive has his backpack open. And the guy who's dead has his backpack closed. What is in the dead man's backpack? Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. There's a riddle for okay. this week. And uh, have, okay. have a think okay. on that. Do you, do you guys have answers? Is it quite simple? It's a fair idea. Go on, idea. Okay. All okay. right. All right. <laughs> well, think about that, and I'll let you know the answer at the end of the episode. You know what? I think I know the answer, Alex. But I'm going to say it now. No, I refuse to participate in a stupid riddle <laughs> about backpacks <laughs> on random fellas in the desert. <laughs> I knew that you wouldn't like this oh, one, Robin. <laughs> why, why do they go in their backpacks? <laughs> He's got poison apples. <laughs> He's got... He's got trainers. He forgot to put them on and he got blisters on his feet and they got infected and he died. Oh, don't give the answer oh, away, Robin. We've got to wait till How the end of the episode. <laughs> they walked into the desert. One of them just had an empty backpack. And the other fella died from exhaustion because he was carrying everything. He just had bricks in his backpack. Or, well, that could be an answer, Robin. He just, yeah. That could be an answer mm -hmm. and you've just given it away. He was throttled in his sleep by the alive guy because he was hungry <laughs> right, and eat him. Because he refused to share what was in his backpack. <laughs> Perhaps, exactly. Perhaps. Lambus yeah. bread. Well, do you know that what? was what was in the backpack. I said, Robin, think about it, and we'll 
<laughs> we'll we'll get the answer at the end of the episode. I don't like I don't like to use this kind of language, uh, but this is BS. Companies <laughs> sort of were so angry about it. It's a fairly it's a fairly straightforward riddle, I think. Well, I two men are in outer space. One of them's dead. Why? Hey, Robin, Robin, look, some people like the riddles. So, <laughs> some people, some people like them. So, uh, some people like fun. We've okay. got to, we've got to keep, keep <laughs> <doing the riddles. laughs> but we should move on for a minute for now. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. But, uh, before then. we jump into the main topic of spies, um, were there any of your favorite comments from the past week that you wanted to raise? Did you have any good comments that you wanted to talk about? Yes, yeah, I, I've got one, <laughs> and it's aimed at you. It's aimed at you, actually, Alex. And this oh, okay. is from um, uh, when we did a little more interesting. We spoke about, you know, the the budget Willy Wonka experience that happened. In Glasgow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where it's basically just an empty <laughs> warehouse um, filled with a, with a couple of of inflatables and a yeah. a, a table with a couple of cups of orange juice on it and lemonade. Genuinely, um, my favourite story of this year so far. That's... Oh, oh, hilarious! Awful for the kids, but still hilarious. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Doom asks, can't believe they didn't hire Alex for Willy Wonka. And, um, and well, firstly, I agree, you know, you should have been hired, especially because you're in, you know, in Scotland. Yeah. But secondly, I was going to ask, what kind of Willy Wonka would you be? Would you be a kind of a, a Gene mm. Wilder Willy Wonka or would you go for the Johnny Depp style? Who, who, who's your, who are you closer to I, character? Who's your Willy of choice? I think, um, exactly. it would definitely be more... Gene Wilder, for sure. I think that kind of like scary element he brings mm. to it randomly mm. it is wild, is, isn't it? is great. You know, I just start like walking around and start slowly singing scary songs like under my breath. Yeah. And the river keeps on flowing <laughs> with no way knowing where it's going. <laughs> what was that part How of the film? I to say, <laughs> you lose. Good yes. day, sir. Yeah. Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. That's good. What's he say? That really great bit where Augustus Gloop is running off and he's like, no, stop. No, Come stop. Back. Wait, don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. Um, go. It's it's a disgrace, to be honest. But uh, no, he did a good job, though. Bless him. He, The guy that they did hire. And I think we talk about this in the little more interesting, but it's actually kind of the one wholesome element of the the story is how all the actors kind of pretty much figured out that they weren't getting paid when they showed up and saw saw the event that was set up. Um, but they still kind of put on as much of a show as they could just to try and make some kids' days. But uh, yeah, I mean, what a, what a story gig. though. Tough gig, yeah, mm. for sure. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, thank you, Martin. Thanks for bringing up that comment. Um, Robin, did you have a comment you wanted to mention? Yeah, I'd like to respond to one of Camera Shy Coco's comments on our last episode of the podcast, which was about the perfect prison. Um, what What is the perfect prison? What's the ideal prison? Um, and Camera Shy Coco always gives us amazing uh, comments, uh, which are a bit long to read out in full. But the gist of this comment was about prisons for profit, thinking in particular, I guess, mm. of America. Um, and uh, Camera Shy Coco says, I understand that it's a well-established industry that makes some people a lot of money and clearly provides jobs to a good number of people, uh, but is not going anywhere anytime fast. But goes on to describe how perhaps the resources that go into private prisons, particularly with all the empty cells, could be better spent on housing the homeless or helping vulnerable people. Um, and concludes by saying... It sure would be nice if we were working as hard at helping people to thrive as we are at keeping them locked up. Mm. And I think yes. that's a, yeah, a very absolutely. yeah noble sentiment. You know, absolutely, when you think about yeah. it, there's a lot of resources allocated to some things that are kind of dehumanizing uh, and then nothing put towards helping people who could use the help. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, in, as Camera Shai Coco mentions in the first sentence, the... The difficulty is that it is that well-established industry mm. that makes people a lot of money. So there's yeah. something in it for them, isn't there? Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, you can't make much to money. Keep people in prison. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And to keep the numbers going up, you've got to have more and more prisoners, I guess, uh, mm, which yeah. is kind of counterproductive to a good, a good society, yeah. <laughs> exactly. a healthy society. Yeah. 
Well, I had a comment from a previous episode of the podcast, and this was when we discussed AI. Um, and this is from Something125, who says, I reckon with AI taking the place of so many jobs, we'll see a rise in busy work prof- professions just to keep people occupied. This will likely be incentivized by the realization that having a large proportion of the workforce unoccupied, bored, and potentially frustrated will lead to unrest. So mm. I could th- I could kind of see this, and I kind of think that this is happening a little bit already. But what do you think? Like, do you think we're just going to see like jobs exist, but they actually they're not really there to do much, if anything at all, mm. or they're just like a to do work that's kind of pointless because the AI is already doing most of the actual important stuff. Middle management it's, office it's, workers it's perhaps, come to mind, I guess. It's perhaps yeah. being it's perhaps being too generous on behalf of of those employing AI mm. to suggest mm. that they would employ mm. people. <laughs> yeah. I think that there there'll be unrest, but uh, they'll put their hands up in the air and say, "Well, it's nothing to do with us," you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> the irony of AI is you can predict it. It's definitely going to be implemented by the types of people and the types of industries and the types of jobs who uh, want to use it to get rid of employees, uh, but actually do the kind of jobs that AI probably could absolutely do instead of the uh, six-figure salary workers that these big corporations <laughs> employ. You know, like you're an admin person you come up with strategy what's what could be better for coming up with business strategy than an ai right <laughs> you know if you want to you know, why use ai the, for menial tasks yeah the, the difficulty i think with employing ai and it is that you lose a lot of that original thought that is the basis on which ai works right so mm-hmm. if you stop people um say, for example, creating photo assets because they believe they can create them with AI, then you're not getting any more original art or original photos from which the AI can work. So you're then in a loop of everything being recycled or almost the same. You're using kind of the the same stock assets and and not moving forward um, because you're always using AI. So Mm. for the sake of, of industry as a whole, you need those base elements, the base assets from which AI can build yeah yeah they they, i mean they've spoke there's been stories about that haven't there like um mid journey and and things kind of breaking because they uh, or will eventually reach a tipping point because the things feet because they look at all the images online basically and then that's how they can pass it and and generate new images there'll be a tipping point where they're just looking at other ai images and it's kind of like uh, a a spiral spiral Mm. of uh, until eventually it will just break which um every human has who knows? 16 fingers who knows whether that <laughs> will happen that? yeah exactly that type of thing um but it's an interesting point robin that, that, that you made uh about yeah i mean like it's interesting because lots of ai is trying to replace kind of creative roles like uh creative writing and and yeah photos yeah. and now videos with sora when it seems like that's the that's kind of a difficult thing to replace it's interesting that there's so much effort has gone into that feels like a very business heavy decision that's made that whereas yeah, mm-hmm. yeah well, like you know why it AI, is and i hate to be admin and stuff would be easier sorry i hate to be mean-spirited but i think at the root of it it's because the type of people who make ai and the type of people who want to use ai are the kind of people who can't do creative stuff and so they're, they're jealous deep down psychologically they're jealous they just want to get rid of those people who can do creative stuff um and the irony there of course mm. there are lots of people who succeed very well in the creative industries and the creative arts who really should be working in mcdonald's behind a counter you know just like oh hot take <laughs> yeah fire, fire shot. i mean yeah. <laughs> admittedly if i could put a single red dot on a canvas and sell it for five million pounds as modern art i would and maybe my the real <laughs> talent there is salesmanship you know but mm. uh as as art is it art you've just given is someone it? a great idea robin and if you don't do it then someone mm. else will so be the change yeah, you want to see and put that red dot on a canvas <laughs> and uh no but i don't want to see that change <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh well fair enough well again that was also an interesting discussion with you robin 
um, on that episode. So yeah, go and watch it if you haven't already. Speaking of comments and people that we want to, oh, sorry, was there anything else you wanted to raise, Robin? Or I think I was going to do what you were about to You were about to segue in the same way that I was going to? Dude. Possibly, yeah. Fair enough. Well, I'll I'll, I'll, ch- I'll chuck the ball over to you because I think you wanted to say a little extra special thank you to some of our amazing Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Yes, I did. Thank you, Alex. And in particular, I would like to thank Amy Licious, Cindy Hafner, James, Rashad Najar, Caleb Wilkerson, Kurt Jones, John Baker, Janie, Henny Ruffle, The Super Show Podcast... Nicholas Dill, Emmett Tapier, Ahmad, Peaseward, A Filthy Casual, and Simon Workman. Thank you so much for your special silver and gold tier support. You're amazing, as are all of our wonderful Patreon supporters and YouTube members, uh, who not only get access to the aforementioned a little more interesting episodes, uh, we'll be recording one straight after we recorded this, but they also get little sneak peek previews, and access to our Discord server, and... I mean, occasionally we do check in and just, you know, ask for your thoughts about things on the channel, uh, on, yeah. on Patreon and maybe on the YouTube membership thing as well. What's it called? Community tab. That's community the tab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Keep an eye on our community <laughs> tab. Uh, but thank you all very, very much. And if if you don't want to be a Patreon supporter or YouTube member, that's absolutely fine. Just enjoy watching and, you know, give us a like, subscribe if you haven't already, share this podcast with your friends if you think they'll enjoy it, even if they don't think. Enjoy it. Just share it with them, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Robin, don't sound too desperate. <laughs> yeah, he's, begging, he's begging now. <laughs> please, please help us. Help us. We, need, we need all the help we can get. Um, <laughs> but yes, shall we, with that all said and done, shall we jump into the main topic, and it's spies. This week, we thought we would discuss some of the greatest spies in history. And it's kind of, um, what's the word? Um, Almost difficult to say because the best spy in history is probably one that you've never heard of or we've never heard of. So maybe the people that we're going to talk about are actually pretty terrible at their jobs. (laughs) But But let's not choose to look at it that way. I think some of the people we're going to talk about have some pretty incredible stories to tell. Yeah, who who have you gone for this week then? Uh, I have chosen um, Francis Walsingham, or Sir Francis Walsingham, who you may have heard of if you're a fan of the Tudors, uh, because he was Queen Elizabeth I's spy master. Mm. And he was the first person to be appointed by a monarch in the world to as the official leader of a spy network. So... Uh, England has the honour of having the first official OG. national spy network in the world, which is why, of course, James Bond is British, because the yeah, best spies are British. We have kind of carried on that, that trend, trend, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Francis Walsingham uh, was a fascinating fella, uh, capable of some dark things. It was the Tudor period. Mm. Uh, he was born in 1532 and died in 1590. And he was officially the principal secretary to Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, but he was a very talented and interested uh, gatherer of knowledge. And in his own words, uh, knowledge has no price, I believe, is his famous line. And he's more or less behind all of Elizabeth I's uh, major successes because... This was the height of the tensions between Protestants and Catholics. Henry VIII, Elizabeth I's father, had overseen the Reformation in which, in which uh, the Church of England was formed and split from the Catholic Church, which meant that there was lots of unrest and Catholics murdering Protestants and Protestants murdering Catholics. And all the Catholic nations of Europe, particularly France and Spain, were had their daggers out for England, which was this threat, not only politically but now religiously and obviously the vatican rome the pope wasn't too happy that they'd lost a valuable source of income and power so francis walsingham as a protestant and like a passionate protestant as well identified the catholic threat as the major threat and there were numerous assassination attempts uh, on elizabeth I. but through his uh, extensive and clever tricks of the trade um, more or less inventing what is now spycraft all the classic tricks that are the foundations of modern national spy spying techniques a lot of them were used and sometimes invented by him and wow. uh, 
one thing he was really keen on was uh, getting up a network of informants. And his major successes were not only foiling these assassination attempts on Queen Elizabeth I, but also securing her reign in such a way that it had lasting impacts on possibly the rest of history. So probably most famously, we've heard of the Spanish Armada. I think even our American listeners and our listeners from other continents will, may have heard of the Spanish Armada, this epic fleet of ships, an invasion force sent by the King of Spain to invade um, Britain. But thanks to a bit of help from the terrible British weather, um, the British Navy was able to see <laughs> them off. And a big part of that was because Walsingham had all the spies in place that he set up basically bribed people in the Spanish court to know that it was happening before it happened. In a similar mm -hmm. vein, Sir Francis Drake, <coughs> the uh, famous explorer that many of you may know, if only through the Uncharted games, um, <laughs> did a successful naval raid on the Spanish port of Cadiz uh, in the 1580s, uh, 1583, I want to say. Uh, and that was really successful because he deliberately fed false information to the Spanish court that Francis Drake was going to attack a different place so the Spanish went and prepared for that. But he got uh, two birds with one stone because Francis Walsingham was pretty sure that the English ambassador to France was actually a spy for the French and giving information to them. So he, oh. he thought he'd test this by giving the English ambassador this fake plan for this attack by Sir Francis Drake. And then if he was... Uh, a double agent in the pay of the French and the Spanish, uh, then the Spanish would mm. act on this false information and it, he would not only help the attack by Sir Francis Drake, but also expose a spy. And he did. That's he was, pretty clever. He was correct. That's pretty clever. Yeah. yeah. His crowning achievement, though, was probably Mary, Queen of Scots, who anybody who's interested in Mary, Queen of Scots, I recommend you read a book about her or watch either of the films of that name. Um, one from the 1970s, one quite recently with Saoirse Ronan uh, and Margot Robbie. Because uh, she had a terrible, terrible life, just but a completely topsy-turvy one. But she spent the last 17 years of it imprisoned by Elizabeth I. And she was Catholic, whereas Elizabeth was Protestant. And Mary had a stronger claim to the English throne than Elizabeth did. So that she was a real threat to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was very reluctant to invade Scotland and kill Mary because not only possibly because she may have respected her, but also because she didn't want to establish the precedent that you could kill a queen because, you know, <laughs> her own life might therefore be under threat. Sure, but Walsingham, yeah. <laughs> Walsingham was convinced and correctly convinced that Mary was not a friend to Elizabeth and was in fact an enemy. And he foiled two major plots by Mary working with the French and the Spanish to stage an uprising in England or starting in Scotland and uh, an invasion by the French and Spanish to simultaneously like two-pronged attack uh, conquer England and overthrow Elizabeth and he um, intercepted both by planting agents to act as Mary's couriers so they would carry letters to and from Mary and her co-conspirators, or rather to her friends who are Catholics who would then pass on the letters to the French and the Spanish. Um, but as part of this trick, um, Walsingham you know, invent, pioneered techniques such as opening a wax-sealed letter and resealing it as if it had not been opened at all. Mm. Uh, stuff like that. And of course, invisible ink and things like mm -hmm. that to pass secret messages. Yeah. And I think um, the second plot uh that Mary made whilst she was in prison was um, he planted an agent who, instead of taking the letters to Mary's co-conspirators, would copy the letters and put them in barrels, uh, wine barrels, I think. Um, and then those barrels would get delivered to London um, and then they could open the letters. And he built, he built up a pile of these letters of Ma in Mary's handwriting saying, yes, come on, invade, and I'll help you uh, depose my um, my enemy, uh, Elizabeth I. And eventually he, piled up, he gathered enough of these letters and then showed them to Elizabeth I and said, look at your pal Mary. <laughs> mm -hmm. she, she's not a good person. I mean, she, she was right. in prison, so it's understandable that Mary would want to overthrow Elizabeth I, the woman who had imprisoned her. But um, 
yeah, it's uh, on the on those all ah, because of those letters, Elizabeth was persuaded to order Mary's execution, and Mary was executed. At the same time, um, Scotland was being ruled by Mary's half brother, James, who um, was essentially acting as a kind of regent, and his son, also James, would late, would become Elizabeth the first successor, and that whole thing led to the union of Scotland and England, which would eventually become the United Kingdom, the modern nation that we have now, and of course wow. build a huge empire <laughs> off the back of Scotland and England being united, because a lot of the imperial expansion that happened in the 1800s and the early 19... Uh, sorry, in the 1700s and the early 1800s happened was led by Scottish people, um, explorers and scientists. There had been a whole Scottish uh, renaissance uh, where lots of scientific advancements and technological advancements were made in Scotland. And that only happened, that only benefited, sorry, the United Kingdom and therefore the British Empire mm -hmm. because Scotland and England became united. And they only became united because James the Sixth of Scotland became James the First of England, which only really happened because Walsingham spent his entire career, decades, fostering good relationships with between Elizabeth and James and undermining and eventually killing Mary, Queen of Scots. Wow. Wow. Um, so a huge effect on, on huge history. Huge effect on history, yeah. yeah. Wow. And all, he did all this from 1871 to, sorry, from 1571 to 1590 when he died. He had testicular cancer and was in constant pain and discomfort. Wow. Wow. Yeah. There we go. That's crazy. He has a bit of a Do reputation for being brutal. Um, but actually, by the standards of the day, he was he was all right. He actually um, didn't like torture. He reserved it only for very, very particular cases. <laughs> oh, that's um, good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> good he man. even good man. In fact, his uh, man of morals. He probably um, his secretary wrote uh, a long kind of treatise against torture and said we shouldn't torture people. This is why. And historians believe Walsingham probably instructed him or allowed him, said, encouraged him to write that and say, torture is bad. Torture is very bad. But he probably approached it from a pragmatic point of view, which is if you torture your, our enemies, then people become sympathetic towards them. Mm -hmm. And so it's probably a good idea not to torture them. The only time smart he, guy. He was a smart guy. Yeah. And the best thing is uh, there are of the assassination plots that he foiled. He gathered the information very cleverly and then allowed these people to attempt the assassination attempts, but caught them in the act, which meant it. it was impossible for them to deny it. It's like, we've got you. Um, yeah. So he was a very clever man. He knew how to play chess. Let, let them hang themselves with their own rope, so to speak. Yes, like, exactly. Uh, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, that's Sir Francis Walsingham, the first spy master, the first official spy master of the Western world and... Uh, often considered kind of the founder of what is now mm. uh, the British uh, Secret Service. Wow. The spy state. I'd, I'd never heard of him. So he's done his job very no, well. It's amazing. Well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other thing. He was very secretive and he didn't make notes about his own um, techniques. So He'd seen what could happen to notes. Yeah. Someone else was <laughs> compiling a big list of them somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very true. So very the true. stuff we know about him mm. is stuff other people uh, wrote down, you know, his his uh, his colleagues, so to speak. Um, so it's possible that he in, was even more knowledgeable and more skilled than we know mm. because we can only judge him by his results. Yeah. He hacked and cloned Mary Queen of Scots DMs, so... <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Um, so I've gone for a, a classic Soviet-era spy. Oh. Um, yeah, I know, I know. We've got to have one of these, haven't we? Uh, mm -hmm. A man by the name of Dmitry Polyakov, whose code name was Top Hat. It's always no good. I love the, I love the code awesome. names. They're great, aren't they? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. You need a, a code name. You need an H. Um, and he was a, a double agent. So, oh, well, officially he was a double agent. We'll come back to that. Um, but he was a, a Soviet uh, major general um, who who was yeah he was called Top Hat by the CIA so on on their side um, but began his career in the intelligence um, in the Soviet military intelligence agency 
so he was the head of the GRU, which is their, yeah, the military intelligence agency, the head of the GRU's station at the United Nations, um, where, of course, therefore he had access to that pretty, pretty valuable intelligence. Um, and he decided a little bit later, and he was a spy for the US, uh, for the CIA for about 20 years, but he decided to, to become a spy um, because he was disillusioned with what the Soviets were doing, supposedly, um, had ideological differences, and also they were going to pay him a lot of money. So, <laughs> so he was a little <laughs> bit of a mercenary as well. Um, if you're good so at something, never do it for free. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So he got in touch with the United States in the 1960s, early 1960s, and basically said, look, I'm in a high-ranking position within the GRU. I have access to all of this amazing intelligence. Um, let me come and work with you. Um, so he he supplied loads of information um, relating to like Soviet mili- military capabilities, um, troop deployments, um, and in, in their intentions as well. So he gave insights into the um, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan as well, um, which really um, shaped the way in which the US reacted to those uh, heightened uh, moments in history. Um, he also provided evidence that there was a rift between the Soviet Union and China, which then led Nixon um, to start or improve uh, US relations with China and build up a bit of a a rapport with them um, because he could see that um, they were, you know, turning against the the Soviet Union in the 1970s. Um, He also gave technical data on anti-tank missiles that the Soviets were were using. Um, And so when um, Iraq used... um, uh, well, Iraq and you know in the Gulf War, um, they had knowledge of these anti-tank missiles. So the US, of course, never fought Soviet <coughs> Union directly, but in proxy wars, this information proved invaluable. Mm-hmm. And then he also was able to provide um, information on who the moles were within oh. the intelligence agency as well, oh, okay. um, because he could go back to the, the Soviet Union and and they would disclose who was working abroad and, and one high profile uh, member who was unearthed was Frank Bossard, who was a British intelligence official um, who he identified as being a mole for the USSR. But there is question marks over whether he was actually a triple agent. Oh. Mm, well, right. How does that even work? <laughs> well, <laughs> well what? So, so a spy for the Soviet Union in America yeah. And then the Americans think he's working for them, but actually he's then working for the Soviet Union. Giving them some, like, right. so he's giving them some information to get gain their yeah. trust kind of thing, but... Uh, That's it. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that definitely points uh, away from this is the fact that he eventually was um, dobbed in by another a mole within the, the CIA. Okay. Um, a man by the name of, I want to get this right, uh, a man <coughs> by the name Aldrich Ames, <clears throat> 1986. Oh. CIA, CIA officer okay. working yeah. for the Soviet Union um, identified him, passed on the sense of information that he was actually a, a double agent, betraying him. Uh, and this led to his trial uh, behind closed doors, yet yeah, no public trial here, behind closed doors and execution in oh 1988 so he after 20 years of, of supposedly spying for the cia he was killed but the the kind of um the argument against this was that he actually wasn't killed for being a double agent because he was a triple agent but he was giving the cia more information than the soviets wanted and so they were angry with him upset with him thought that he was giving away too much information and killed him because of that which is what, so the theory is the Soviets exposed him as a triple agent. Is that the, the theory so? is that the that a Soviet yeah a Soviet yeah. Um, <clears throat> double agent, right? So working for the Soviets but in the CIA yeah. exposed him, 
Uh, well, sorry, the official line is that they exposed him as being a double agent and then the Soviets killed him. Right. But the argument for him being a triple agent and the reason why the Soviets killed him, even though he was working for the Soviets, the triple agent was because he gave away too much information to the CIA. Right. As 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 a double right. agent. <laughs> you see? <laughs> right. You see? So they thought he was a triple agent, but he was actually just a double agent. Well, does well, that make him a quadruple agent? If someone thinks you're a triple agent, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, and you're so, a... so the idea being the idea being that he was a double agent, so actually working for the the US, but the Soviets think that he's working for them. The official line is that the Soviets then found out because they had a mole within the CIA yes. who reported back and they killed him. But there's an argument for him being a triple agent, and actually the reason they killed him was not because he was a double <laughs> agent. They knew that he was. A, they knew that he was working for them, the Soviets. But they killed him because he was giving too much information away to the CIA. Yeah. Do you th- so he was Accident- meant to be giving a like little bit of information, but he was giving of, too much. Yeah. Do you yeah, think wow. as well it could be a case of kind of like he's 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 been burnt almost. His identity's been been found out, and so in order to maintain the mm. from the Soviets' point of view, in order to maintain the, the story. That he was. The story that he's a double agent. He was a double yeah. agent, not a triple agent. They just had him killed. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, and like, um, I mean, yeah, perhaps Ames didn't know that he was a uh, actually a triple agent. Perhaps <laughs> and then once he reported back, yeah, there was too too far gone for him to be kept alive. Maybe, mm. maybe. Interesting though. Interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, tw- twenty years working as a double agent, and yeah, passing intelligence over to the CIA. Um, covert communications um, and yeah a lot of it was around military deployments tech technological developments and of course assessments of 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 the intentions of the soviet union mm. so really high level stuff because he was like you know a general within within the um the military intelligence of the soviet union so really high level um, pieces of information um and he he was basically gone down as as one of the according to the USA as one of the greatest double agents they've ever had almost like a martyrdom right he was caught yeah. killed incredible bravery for so long to be able to maintain your cover for that long yeah. it's just actually insane um think of the stress of that every single day oh. knowing that like if you're caught you're just you're going to get killed um yeah and just having to do that yeah. every single day yeah fine. yeah I know, I know. You, you, you'd imagine that the pay was probably pretty good, right? <laughs> so. It's got to be paid know, a yeah. lot of money to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? Yeah. Wow. So what do we know like Star anything Wars. about his motives? Why he wanted to do this? Was it? Um, did he disagree so, with the it, Soviets? Yeah, so ideologically, kind of after the... Uh, when we're looking at kind of the, the post-World War II era and... The annexation of a lot of the a lot of the territories. Yeah, I think he was disillusioned with the way in which um, you know, the Soviet Union was being was being governed. Mm. That's the main thing. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't say too much about you know the specifics of exactly why. Only that he was very much disillusioned with the Soviet Union, and also that basically the USA could pay him a lot lot more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> than which, yeah. I mean, is it worth is it worth the risk? Um, probably not, mm. but that's that's the reason why he was he was doing it. Maybe just like the thrill, you know. You've got to be a certain <laughs> type of person to be yeah. a spy for that lot. Maybe he liked playing people off each other and be like, "Aha, I'm the one who really knows." Yeah, yeah. Or maybe he got confused. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's like, what "Am year I is a it? double agent or a triple agent?" A <laughs> he's in too agent? deep now. There's no going back. Yeah, yeah. it's just. <laughs> yeah. Keeps going one layer deeper, like Inception. Um, <laughs> yeah. As I was gonna say, I think what's mad is that he was a, you know, a major general. You know, yeah. this is this isn't this isn't some cannon fodder. This is right at the top, and that's why I think why he was such a uh, an incredible asset. I think yeah. it's pretty awesome. I think if I were in his position, I would definitely get try to attempt that for as long as possible. But he he achieved it, whereas I'd probably go go wrong at the first hurdle. Like uh, Robin, mm. you you cc'd in the head of the KGB into that email from the CIA <laughs> on day day one. <laughs> no, <laughs> yes, oh, yeah, nice. yeah. I mean, I mean, a lot of the kind of the the post Cold War 
and more modern reports once once things have been declassified. Mm. Um, D- Deputy Director William Sullivan um, said that, uh, and this is this is to to quote. He yeah he didn't just help the West win the Cold War. Okay, okay, it kept the Cold War from becoming hot. So his wow. in, his intelligence stopped. Could have saved the world. Yeah. Well, potentially, right? Yeah. Potentially. Well, thank you both of you for sharing your people. Um, In a way, both of yours have kind of like far, their actions kind of had far reaching implications. Like your your one, Robin, basically started the spy master networks um, and was the formation of that in, in, you know, the United Kingdom. And Martin, yeah, your guy, his, his actions potentially stopped world war three from breaking out um the the person i've chosen doesn't necessarily have such far-reaching implications but i chose to interpret success the most successful spies in history in a different way and this guy is basically the jammiest slippiest slipperiest guy like of all the spies (laughs) he's being he was uh (laughs) captured like dozens of times throughout his life and at, like sentenced to death at least once and managed to escape. He wasn't a goodie, that's for sure. Oh. But his life is is just an absolute um, train wreck in the best way possible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is the best way of saying it. And this is the story of uh, Frederick Fritz Joubert Duquesne, who uh, was born September 1877, so a little bit further back. Um and he was a South African Boer soldier. Um, he was a longtime prisoner of war, a big game hunter. And at one point, he was the hunting advisor for Theodore Roosevelt. Random. Oh. Um, mm. He was a journalist, which I think was a, a movie critic as well. Got invited to like big movie premieres at the time. Um, a war correspondent, a stockbroker, a saboteur, obviously a spy and an adventurer whose hatred for the British uh, due to their treatment of Boer women and children caused him to volunteer to spy for Germany during both world wars. Um, oh, wow. And he, like, like the people we've mentioned, also had a pretty cool nickname. As a Boer spy, he was known as the Black Panther. And later on, his nickname oh, as cool. a German spy was the Duke. Um, he also went by the codename Dunn. Which is not as exciting. Um, D-O- D-O-N-E. D-U-N-N, which is uh, okay. fine, I yeah. guess. <laughs> it's no top hat. It's no top hat. No top hat. Top hat is much cooler, I think. Though. Yeah. <clears throat> Code name, sorry. But uh, a bit about his background. He was born to a Boer family in Cape Colony in 1877 and later moved with his parents to Nilstrom in the South African Republic where they started a farm. They basically lived in the middle of nowhere here. Um mm-hmm. And at the age of 12, he kills his first person, uh, a Zulu a Zulu tribes person with his own spear, apparently, as in the tribesman's own spear, um, when the tribes person was apparently attacking his family farm. Uh, of course, that's probably his word against, you know, <laughs> I don't know what the evidence a was. A dead Zulu, yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, wow. When he was 17 years old, uh, he went to London for university. However, when the war broke out in 1899, the Boer, Boer War, he returned to South Africa to join the Boer commandos. He was captured, his first capture. He was captured by the British at the <laughs> Battle of Colenso, but escaped. He joined the Boers again Hello. for the Battle of Ber- Bergendal, but they had to fall back to Mozambique, where they were captured by the Portuguese, and he was sent to an internment camp near Lisbon. And at this camp... He okay. charmed the daughter of one of the guards who helped him escape to Paris. <laughs> From there, he made his way back okay. to Aldershot in England, where he, w- with a fake ID that he acquired, joined the British army and got po- just as a way to get sent back to South Africa. Um, so he basically joined up with the people he hated using a fake identity and false documents to then get sent back to South Africa in 1901 as a British officer. Uh, um, um, however when he was a British officer acting as a British officer in South Africa he passed with troops through his parents farm where he grew up 
um, and saw that it had been raised to the ground under Lord Kitchener's scorched earth policy at the time. He found that his mother had been imprisoned in a concentration camp um, and his sister had been raped and killed by British soldiers. And so at this point, horrified and outraged, he made it his life's work to take revenge on Lord Kitchener and the British. Oh, wow. And Not to be too flippant about those horrible war crimes, but he became Charles Bronson in the Death, Death Wish movies, basically. <laughs> I've, I haven't seen the Death Wish movies, actually. Um, Don't. Okay. It's not necessary. But this is where that trope started. They raped and killed my family. They burned my farm to the ground. It was a... I it's a take them down. Yeah, it's very... It's a typical... Uh, what's, the, what's the word? Um... Incite, movie, inciting uh, incident, I guess. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, action film. Yeah, the origin. Yeah, origin, origin story, story yeah. of the of the. Uh, oh my god! quite villain. Yeah. No. And he pursued this aim of killing Lord Kitchener pretty aggressively. He formed tw- a a gang of uh, co-conspirators, a gang of twenty men, um, right, and sought out and tried to well plan to assassinate Lord Kitchener. However. One of the wives of the co-conspirators betrayed the group and the men were arrested um, and court-martialed by the British. And uh, they were all sentenced to death, including him. But he made a deal to get out of this by giving Boer coordinates of their locations to the British in exchange for his life. Phony oh, coordinates, okay. of course. Okay. He wasn't a complete traitor. Uh, okay, good, good, good. Nice, nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, well done, well done. But despite this, he was still court-martialed and sentenced to life in prison. However, oh. the other 20 members of his team were executed by firing squad. Oh, my God. <clears throat> the one that got away. This is, this is, by the way, the third, fourth time he's been <laughs> captured and imprisoned yeah. by the British. Yeah. Um, so already. Pause for a so the wife of one of the other executed men betrayed them yeah yeah their marriage must have been pretty yeah. rocky i don't have any more information on on the wife or uh, <laughs> but yeah. presumably so or or you don't know the the motives it might have been even accidental um yeah i don't know it, imagine if you'd actually <clears throat> succeeded in killing kitchener that would have completely changed the <laughs> world war one you know in, in a big way robin yeah robin let's keep the story going Oh, okay. Okay, okay. okay. Um, So, yeah, he was imprisoned in Cape Town in uh, a prison called the Castle of Good Hope, which is a great name for a prison. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And this was like a maximum security prison. The walls were extremely thick. However, night after night, Duquesne dug dug away at the cement around the stones with an iron spoon. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Literally iron. with a spoon. He did, he did the classic spoon. spoon technique. And he nearly, very nearly escaped one night, but a large stone slipped on his way through the gap and pinned him no. in his tunnel, in this tunnel between the walls. Um, and he was found the next day by a guard unconscious. And they were like, this guy, what are we going to do with him? So they, <laughs> <laughs> so they shipped him off to Bermuda. Uh, oh, well, that's lovely, right? Um, so actually, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. To a to a prison to a prison camp called Burt's Island, which is uh, an internment island, and uh, mm, no, yeah, not quite as good. And one day while he was here, he slipped over the barbed wire fence, swam two and a half kilometers through shark infested waters, and hitched a ride oh on a trawler vessel heading to New York. So he just he managed okay. to escape again. Yeah, he's, he's doing pretty good. Yeah, yeah, um, well done. Having escaped from Bermuda, Duquesne landed in New York City, where he found employment as a journalist for the New York Herald. He really, he really does like just take his situation and run with it. He's like, okay, I'm here. Wow, he's doing all right here, yeah. yeah. Um, and he became he just might chill out for a little bit, yeah. And he kind of he made a name for himself here as a a traveling correspondent, a big game hunter and storyteller. Um, and I think this was the time where he became a personal hunting advisor for Theodore Roosevelt, which yeah. was <laughs> what? Yeah, wild. Course, yeah. um, I think because <laughs> oh, good. there was a whole, I'm not going to go into this bit, but there was a whole kind of story with him and hippos. I think Theodore Roosevelt went through a phase where they were trying to make hippo meat, like like cows, like, uh, like farm oh, okay. hippos for cows. Farm hippos. So okay. 
he yeah. kind of became a bit of a hippo salesman at this point in his life as well. Um, <laughs> but that's just like a tiny little ours. footnote in, the, in his life, to be yeah. honest. Um, Do you think he ever had the conversation? It's like Roosevelt's like, oh, Duquesne, what can, what, how can I pay you for all your service? And he's like, can you kill Kitchener? <laughs> kind of kind of what? <laughs> Kitchener, you know, that bloody, bloody British general. I want to kill him. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give up on this whole hippo venture <laughs> right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm walking out. I'm going to, you know what? Engaging in small talk was a bad idea. Let's just go back to hunting, <laughs> shall we? Hunting in silence. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, uh, and then after, the, after this, uh, he never returned to South Africa and he became a naturalized oh. American citizen in December 1913. Um, oh, just before the war. Mm, mm, yes. And you can guess what's going to happen next. With the outbreak of World War I, uh, Duquesne became a German spy. And he was sent to Brazil as <laughs> Frederick Fredericks. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Under the disguise of doing scientific research on rubber plants. Can we just circle back to the... Uh... To the name <laughs> Frederick <laughs> Fredericks. <laughs> Who's coming up? Who, yeah, they say the Germans don't have a sense of humor. But maybe they also lack an imagination for fake names. <laughs> Frederick Fredericks. This is clearly a case where someone's. My name is Hans Hansen. Well, his, his first name is Frederick, isn't it? So this is clearly a case where he. Someone asked him his name, but he realized he couldn't use his actual name and panicked halfway through. He's like, oh, I'm Frederick. Uh, uh, Fredericks. Fredericks. Yeah. <laughs> what will you actually remember? Yeah. Fredericks. Fredericks. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But, uh, interrupt, Alex. I just, uh, no, no, it's okay. Wow. But from his base in Rio de Janeiro, he planted time bombs disguised as cases of mineral samples on British ships. And uh, he's been credited with sinking 22 ships during World War I. Oh. And among them were the Salvador, the Pembrokeshire, and the Tennyson. Also, at the time, in 1916, the HMS Hampshire was on his list. And who, who was on board? Mm. Lord, Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener. En route to oh, Russia in 1916. Of course, of course. So he claims that he was the man who killed Lord Kitchener. However, it's worth saying that uh, forensic evidence of this doesn't necessarily support this claim. And oh, what? as you right. may see with this man's life, like toward like he's he had because he makes up so many details about himself, he's kind of like a constant a bit of a con man, a bit of a hustler. He, yeah. It's difficult to know when analyzing his biography how much of this stuff was made up and how much uh, right. well, how much truth was in it. Oh, that's a shame because that's the one part of the story, despite the mass murder. Mm. That's the one part of the story I want to be true. <laughs> I want he got Kitchener. He could have, um, though. He could have. There's nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's true. Um, no, done. And towards the end of the war, the he was kind of like not fully burnt. Like his, his idea, it was. I think there were some people that were kind of after him at this point, and he was a bit worried about his identity being found out and discovered mm. so he planted mm. stories in the local newspaper in rio de janeiro and faked his own death um oh. and said that he was of course he did he had been <laughs> of course he did he said that frederick Fredrickson <laughs> had been killed by some amazonian tribes people um uh. and when the heat died down he returned to uh new york <laughs> and <Right>. then <laughs> the balls on this man right so what he did okay. is during the war, he insured cargo on some of the ships that he had planned to sink. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he took insurance out on play. cargo on there and then <laughs> and then returned to New York and tried to cash that insurance. He, he went, marched into a bank and uh, tried to claim <laughs> the insurance on these ships that he sank. Um, wow. Bloody hell. And uh, unfortunately, work? this did not work, and he was arrested. No, of course. So he was arrested in New York, but he was wanted for crimes in Britain. So he was awaiting extradition to Britain for like all the crimes that he committed during the war. Yeah. Um, yeah. But whilst awaiting extradition, he pretended to be paralyzed. He was sent to a prison ward at Bellevue Hospital. And on the 25th of May, 1919, after nearly two years of feigning paralysis, two years? Two years? He was feigning paralysis. That's a long time. 
So by this, that's a long time to be doing that. By this point, they were pretty convinced. Like he he hadn't moved in two years. <laughs> um, but the way your body, you need to move off a yeah, bed, otherwise your bizarre. body does your muscles break no, down. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You cease to work. You get all ah. kinds of bed sores and things. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, I think maybe he was maybe he was getting up no. in the middle of the night and moving around, just doing some stretches. Maybe um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> oh dear. But uh, he disguised himself as a woman and escaped by cutting the bars of his cell and climbing over the barrier walls to freedom. I mean, this is amazing. But also, I, I love the fact that his 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 mind was just like, "I'm going to pretend to be paralyzed before I do the whole cutting the bars thing and slipping out." And then he his brain did the whole. I've, been, I've committed now to the whole paralysis thing. Mm. <laughs> he's carrying <laughs> two Can't years later. Now. He's like, yeah, maybe I'll. <laughs> maybe this isn't going to work. <laughs> I'll just dress as a woman and cut the bars instead. Why didn't I do this a year ago? <laughs> um, and so, about a year after his escape. <laughs> Duquesne appeared in Boston using the pseudonym British Major Frederick Craven. So uh, yeah, Frederick Ian. He was pretending Frederick, to be yeah. a British Major at this point. And he's known to you've used Craven. several more names as well. But this period of his life is pretty, is a little is known. However, it is known that he worked as a freelance journalist and an agent for Joseph P. Kennedy's film production company. He's, I mean, he's had a varied life, hasn't he? Let's be honest. Yeah. But Joe Kennedy was ambassador to Britain and, of course, father of... It's the same Kennedy, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, oh, yeah, I think it was actually. Yeah, the Kennedy dad, isn't it? Yeah. So mm. he's got that connection as well. I think at yeah. some uh, during this wow. point, he did also um, try to write his biography and sold his film, the film rights for his life story called "The Man Who Killed Kitchener" to a film production company as well. So he, he, he really wanted yep. to cement that legacy. Well, yeah, whether rightly or wrongly, he seems <clears> to want to sell everything, doesn't he? He does. <laughs> yeah. Happy, happy, gaining a quick buck or anything. <laughs> Um, in 1932, you'll never guess what happened again. He was arrested <laughs> and, uh, and betrayed again by a woman who revealed his true identity to the FBI, who uh, caught up with him and, and arrested him. And British authorities requested that he be extradited, but he fought his charge in court. And the judge, the judge ruled that although the charges did have merit, the statute of limitations had expired. Because he kept escaping from them. So, <laughs> so yeah. yet again, he managed to escape justice. Um, Does that loophole work now? Can you just escape from prison? And, and then be like, yeah, time's up. Yeah. You can't catch like, it's, it's, it's expired <laughs> you think, you now. think it would restart when you get yeah, caught again? I'd have thought so. You've been convicted once. Sure, surely that counts. Weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You would think. Um the, the next major part of his life is obviously during the breakout of World War II, um, where he formed the Duquesne, Duquesne spy ring. And he was obviously working as a German spy in the US. And here he formed a, the largest spy ring for Germany in the US with 33 members. Did the Americans not think to check in on him at the beginning of the war? You know, you would have thought. You would have thought. History. Mm. Well, actually... Yes, they did, correctly. Uh -huh. um, because on the 28th of June, 1941, following a two-year investigation, the FBI arrested Duquesne along with two associates on charges of relaying secret information on Allied weaponry and shipping movements to Germany. And agents, well they were filmed as part of a sting provided by uh, another spy, William G. Siebold, who was acting as a double agent for the U.S., meant to be spying for Germany, but was actually spying for the US. Um, and he arranged a meetup with Duquesne where they filmed, the FBI record, filmed and recorded Duquesne and the whole plot unfolded from there, basically. And on the 2nd of January, 1942, 33 members of his spy ring were sentenced to serve a total of more than 300 years in prison. And, okay, uh, so 10 years each. Yeah. It yeah, sounds so bad. Very it doesn't actually way. sound too bad. <laughs> <laughs> but one German spy master later commented that the Rings Roundup delivered the death blow to their espionage efforts in the United States. Um, nice. And it was one of the greatest uh, spy roundups in US history. And sadly, well, sadly, story. probably not sadly, at this point, he didn't escape. He was sentenced, oh. he was sentenced uh. to 18 years in prison. 
what happened to him in prison? Did well, he? in 1954, he was released owing to ill health, having served 13 years in prison. And, was uh, he really ill? Oh, he died <laughs> 13 years. No. We don't anymore, do we? He died uh, at a city hospital on Welfare Island, now Roosevelt Island, on the 24th of May, 1956, at the age of 78. So he lived lived a decent amount okay. of time, but a lot of his That's life was good. behind bars, despite his valiant efforts at trying to escape. It's not really known how much of his life was kind of fiction and how much was true. There's certainly a legend mm. surrounding him, but uh, interesting man. And I, yes. I guess I mean, yeah. most successful in just escapes, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and just yeah. confidence. Yeah, to have, have the confidence, you just mm. need a lot of uh, gumption to do what he did. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, do we have, do we have any pictures of him as well? Yeah, yeah. There are pictures of him. There are actually it- pictures from the 1941 when he had met up with William Siebold. Uh-huh. There are pictures of that kind of clandestine meeting because the FBI had rigged Siebold's place with like cameras uh-huh. and recording devices. So it's pretty well documented. Um, and presumably, mm. there are cutting edge cameras and things. Not. Uh, like, I mean, you know, like old fashioned cameras were really big and bulky. <laughs> It's it's, like, it's got it's, some new furniture in here, William. So, yeah, I don't mind the uh, the extra cabinets that are suddenly stuck all over the place. Yeah, and don't mind those big holes in them. That I need to get the the carpenter in to fix the holes. And the sound of <laughs> the whirring sound you hear is just uh, it's just the extractor fan in the in the shower. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't pay any mind. I'm surprised that has not that must have been turned into a film at some point. You'd think so, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'm I'm Hello, sure John. it has been, but yeah, not nothing recent. Um, there was a, a documentary film in 1999 called uh, The Man Who Would Kill Kitchener. Um, but yeah, nothing like a, like no action retelling of his life or anything like that. Do you think it's because he, for a large part of his life, was the baddie? Like, I mean, yeah, he's so, he was a German mm-hmm. spy in both wars. He's not, he doesn't have a lot of redeeming traits about him, other than the fact that the British no. killed his family and that's why... He hated the British. So That's much. true. His origin story doesn't paint British in a good light. So no, unless they wipe, they they change it, whitewash it, and it just starts the film just like I hate Kitchener, but I even, really hate Kitchener. But even <laughs> still, like, I mean, he's like, ah, oh, I just hate him. This is a man who I believe won an Iron Cross as well for his efforts in the war. Um, wow. So like, yeah. I mean, in World War One, yeah. yeah, credited with sinking over twenty ships. Um, and possibly including one containing Lord Kitchener. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's the thing. Yeah, he certainly didn't... Um, I mean, you might have left with regrets, but left no stones unturned. He certainly didn't back out from a a fight or a, mm-hmm. or an escape attempt. or You know, he went for it, didn't he? If nothing else. Mm. But anyway, wow. three varied and very different stories <laughs> of spies throughout yeah. history. We hope you enjoyed this and uh, let us know in the comments down below or whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on, or you can contact us over on X um, at JInterestingYT, or I'm at Just Alexing. I'm at Mart Interesting. I'm at All Time Robin. Um, yeah, let us know if there's any other spies that we missed off this list or any other one stories of spies that we should look into in some point in the future. Um, and while you're on a podcast platform, if you are listening to this over there, why not give us a review if you've enjoyed this episode? Or um, if you're on YouTube, feel free to give this video a like and subscribe uh, if you're not already. But yeah, no, fellas, do you want the answer to the riddle? Well, I think you've, I suspect you've already got it, but uh, <laughs> should I read yeah, it again? Let's, let's go through it. Yeah. Yes. So I'll read it one more time. Two men are in a desert. They both have backpacks on. One of the guys is dead. The guy who is alive has a backpack open and the guy who's dead has his backpack closed. What is it in the dead man's backpack? Uh, Say it, Martin. Three, it. two, one. It's a parachute. parachute. No, <laughs> no, it's not. It's uh, bricks. Robin had it right. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a parachute. It's a parachute. Good. Because they've just parachuted into the desert. The desert yeah. is a red herring. It could be anywhere. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. I mean, what I'd ask is, why isn't the guy whose backpack is open divulging any information about what happened to the other man? Good question. That's very true. This is just immediately after, like straight away. He hasn't had time maybe to react. Maybe it happened. 
I'm afraid you're going to have to work this one out. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a story. Two men are in a desert. <laughs> have a look in his backpack. No, 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 don't open it. You have to guess. <laughs> Very good. Imagine I mean, doing, the police you know, would hate that kind of witness, wouldn't they? <laughs> Well, thank you guys for indulging me in this discussion. It's, as always, been an absolute treat. And thank you at home for listening. And with that, we'll say goodbye. Enjoy the rest of your weeks. And we shall see you next time. Thank you both so much. Bye for now.